A woman reaches a certain age. When someone says to her, or her own inner critic says, at your age, you shouldn't, you wouldn't, you can't. Well, here on a certain age, we celebrate those women who will, who can, and who do amazing things. My guest today is Dr. Taisha Wilson. She's the uh, Chief of Surgery, Breast Surgery at Richmond University Medical Center. She's an experienced oncoplastic breast surgeon with a passion for women's health and treating breast disease. She's conducted extensive research and has treated thousands of women. Dr. Wilson holds a strong belief in integrative medicine and has traveled the world studying integrative techniques that pertain to breast disease. She takes a holistic approach to patient care and helps patients identify complementary treatments that will assist in their journey to healing and wellness. Welcome, Dr. Taisha Wilson. Thank you so much for coming today. Oh, thank you. It's a privilege and honor to be here with you. <laughs> so I want to start by talking about you. Okay. <laughs> so not only are you the chief of breast surgery at your university hospital, you're a single mom with two young kids. Like, how do you do this? It, it takes a village just to raise children, and somehow you're raising these two adorable kids. <laughs> Um, oh, and you're the chief of surgery. Like, how did you get there? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, it certainly has been a journey. And I'll just add that I had both of my children after 40. So my first son was at 42, and my second at 46. Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> didn't know that. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been an adventure for sure. Uh, but I have to say, you know, I rely on help, you know, I rely on a great nanny, um, you know, I make things very clear when I take a new position about what my priorities are and what I am available for and not available for. And I uh, really always have to take a strong stand uh, for myself and for my family. And, uh, and when I'm at work, I give work 110%. Um, but I also try very hard to keep things balanced. So I think you are the poster child of you can have it all, right? You have an amazing career and you have an amazing family. Yeah. And I guess strict balance and a good nanny, that's what Absolutely. I'm hearing. <laughs> So here's the secrets are. Keep your nanny happy. <laughs> <laughs> happy nanny, happy life. That's a new one. We'll remember that. So anyway, thank you again for coming today. Um, and I, I just, I'm so excited for this segment to talk about the health of women. It's so important. Um, I was at a soccer mom dinner a while back, and there were eight of us at the table. So all women, I guess, mainly in our 40s and 50s. And out of the eight, five of them had had breast cancer, which just blew my mind. And I know the rest of us, all of us, are afraid. Yeah. What are our odds? What's a woman's odds of getting breast cancer? And yeah. what increases or decreases her odds? Sure. You know, the odds are basically one in eight women in their lifetime will develop a breast cancer. And that's assuming that women age live to the age of 85. And as we know, women are living longer and longer. And so that's why we're seeing you know, higher incidences of breast cancer. Now, breast cancer traditionally has been sort of a disease of older women, and it's still true that as you age, your risk of developing a breast cancer increases. Um, but, you know, my youngest breast cancer patient so far has been 26. Oh, wow. um, so we really do see breast cancer in younger women too. So I say that to say, you know, if you're a woman and you have breast, you're at risk. Even men are at risk, but it's a smaller, you know, smaller amount. But, um, but we really need to really make sure that we know our bodies and we're being proactive with our health. And what are some factors that maybe increase or decrease the chances of breast cancer? You said being older, right? right? Um, I've heard things about if you've uh, breastfed a, a baby, maybe it's less, or what about smoking? Like, what are some of the factors sure. that help or don't help. Right. So breastfeeding is actually protective. Um, you know, assuming that you breastfeed for at least one year, okay, that can help decrease your risk of breast cancer. Uh, things that increase the risk of breast cancer are smoking, um, diets that are high in fat, um, uh, using extra hormones. 
you know, that's, uh, that's a big hot button topic, particularly nowadays. Um, you know, a lot of postmenopausal women are still using hormones. You know, the unfortunate part about that is, you know, Mother Nature was protective, right? So she designed menopause partly so that you would cut away that extra estrogen exposure and that actually decreased your risk of breast cancers, uterine cancers, and certain other reproductive cancers. So after menopause, when we in reintroduce these hormones, it does increase the risk. Um, and so, you know, I tell people to really have a conversation with your health care provider and see, you know, if it is absolutely necessary for you. And for some women, it will be. And then you want to make sure that you're really on the lowest dose possible with a plan to taper off. Okay, yeah. so it's a good idea then, I guess, to look at other options when you're menopausal, you start getting the hot flashes or whatever. Don't mm -hmm. just say hormones are it. Look for options, exactly. right? And then another big topic is genetics, you know, so mm -hmm. there are some people who have gene mutations in their family which increase their risk of developing you know, certain cancers, including breast cancer. And so part of every evaluation I do now is really talking to a woman about her family history mm -hmm. and seeing if there's any indication that she might be at a risk for having a genetic predisposition. And if she is, then I offer her genetic testing. All right, so you bring up a great topic, and we'll just jump right to that, which is a few years ago, Angelina Jolie brought up the issue or brought it to the forefront that she had a genetic mutation and she had both breasts removed. Right. Um, what do you say? I mean, if a woman shows a predisposition, she does get genetic testing, and she shows she's got the gene for breast cancer, what do you recommend? Should she just have radical surgery? Is that the only way out? No, not at all. You know, I think it's a very individualized um, decision. And first of all, there are different genes. So BRCA gene, which is the one that Angelina Jolie had and people are the most familiar with, you know, we know has the highest risk of developing breast cancer. Um, and for many of those families, you know, I'll hear stories like, yeah, you know, my grandmother had breast cancer, my mother had breast cancer, her sister had ovarian cancer, and you know, it just goes on and on. And as a young woman, if you've basically seen every woman in your family go through a breast cancer diagnosis and treatment, it's not radical surgery for you, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it's taking ownership over your health. It's saying, I have a choice and I'm going to exercise this choice, which will decrease my risk of getting a breast cancer significantly. Um, but it's not the right answer for every woman. And so for some women, we have a discussion and we get on with what I call a 6-6 protocol and I see them every six months and we alternate mammogram with MRI and I follow them very closely and, uh, and they do very well. So it's really an individual decision. Okay, well, it's nice to know there are options. Yeah. So what, I mean, as women, what do we need to do to really take control of our breast health? Okay, okay. So honestly, and you know, I am a Western trained physician with an Eastern bent. <laughs> okay, I like that. Um, but honestly, you know, the most important thing after the age of 40 is getting mammograms every year, okay? And, um, and the reason why, and a lot of times I think people don't understand the reason why, you really want to get a breast cancer before it's big enough to be felt. And very often breast cancers start as little microcalcifications in the breast. And the best way to find these microcalcifications is on mammogram. It's the only study we have that reliably picks up the very early breast cancer. And so here's the impact of that. You know, when a woman is diagnosed with stage zero breast cancer, when it's just, you know, inside the ducts of the breast and hasn't gone anywhere, the five-year survival, 100%. That woman doesn't have to have chemotherapy. You know, doesn't have to have, you know, a lot of the more aggressive type therapies. So it's so important because not only does it impact survival, it impacts treatment. And you really want to be catching disease early when it's less impactful for you, for your family, for everything and everyone in your life. 
Oh my goodness. So I have to jump over here to the viewers. Get your mammogram, right? It's so easy to push off for a while. Get your mammogram. We just heard zero, right? Zero percent of yeah, five, five years, of hundred yeah, percent, five, five year survival, survival rate if you catch it early enough. So yeah. get your mammogram. Um, now, what if, because we're supposed to check for lumps, um, what, what are we going to feel, right? I've had my doctor tell me, feel your breasts, look for lumps. What does a lump feel like? like is right. it? sand? Is it jello? Is it uh, shot? What, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you know, the interesting thing about breast self-examinations is that everyone's breast tissue is different. Some women have extremely lumpy breasts. There are lumps all over. Some women's breast tissue is very smooth and very soft and very fluid and there are, there are no lumps. The important part is knowing your own breast tissue. Right, so I happen to have very lumpy breasts. I was in the shower one day, I was doing an exam, and I said, this is new, you know, this isn't Sally or Josie. <laughs> you know, what is this? You know, yeah. but I was able to know that something was different because I actually know what my breasts feel like, mm -hmm. and I know what my own lumps are. And so I went to the office, I put an ultrasound on it. Oh, okay, it was a breast cyst, fine. I drained it and get on with my day. Um, I'm sorry. You know, I go to the office, I just do an ultrasound, drain my own breast, and go on with my day. So I just had to, <laughs> had to stop there. It's not, it's not everyone's average day, yeah, everyone right? Everyone doesn't do that? That's, no. <laughs> the average day of a surgeon, you know, just lopped off the lump. We're all good. Anyway, so sorry, but I just love the way you said it and got on with my day. It's like other people say, I had breakfast and got on with my day. Um, so what other symptoms are we looking for? So we've, we'll, we'll talk a minute, in a minute about what to do. But lumps is one thing, but what else? What else should we be cognizant of? So other things that I get concerned about is bloody nipple discharge. Um, you know, if a woman tells me, uh, Dr. Wilson, I stepped out of the shower and there was blood dripping from my nipple. You know, that makes me more concerned that there could be an underlying breast cancer. Uh, the other thing is, you know, as you look at your breast, and I hope everyone is looking at their breast, um, in the mirror, you know, if you see any bulges, if you see any retractions, any dimpling, you know, your nipples now pointed in when it used to point out, any of these signs, um, you should, you know, make an appointment to see. You know, usually you start with your gynecologist at first, and then your gynecologist will typically send you to uh, a breast surgeon or a breast expert like me. Okay. So I was going to ask about that, about, so what, what is the timing? So say, you know, as a woman, I feel a lump and I go, oh my goodness, that's not Josie. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's something new that I, I'm not expecting. Do I drop everything and run to my gynecologist? Do I just call and say, hey, I've got a lump, get there in a week or two, or can I ignore it for a month? That's a very excellent question. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, the first thing I want to say to women is don't panic. Okay. You know, 80% <laughs> of the lumps that we feel are benign or not cancer. Okay. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take action. You know, if you feel something and you recognize that this is different, you know, then you need to call your gynecologist and say, listen, you know, I feel a breast lump. I need to come in and get evaluated, okay? Um, and you'll probably get an appointment in you know, within a week or two, and that's just fine, okay? Uh, from there, your gynecologist will either send you directly to a breast surgeon like me, mm -hmm or we'll order some studies. So probably order a mammogram and an ultrasound, okay? And they'll ask you where the area is that you're feeling and they'll take some special views just in that area and investigate a little further, okay? If there's something that the radiologist feels, you know, is questionable, then they might say we want to, you know, do a biopsy. Now again, a biopsy doesn't mean it's bad. Okay. It means that we're not sure what this is. So we're going to stick a needle in and get a little tissue and check it out. And then, so that's usually the next step. Okay. Um, and what, so let's say they do an ultrasound, could do a biopsy, your gynecologist says you need to speak to a surgeon like yourself. And we'll get into your specialty in a minute because you, you've taken surgery to a new, a new place. <laughs> 
Um, but what can I expect? Like, how long? How long is the treatment? Do, does everyone get surgery? Um, sort of, what do, what can I expect to happen physically yeah. speaking? So yeah, that's a very complex question. Um, I always tell people, you know, breast cancer is a thousand and one different diseases, mm -hmm. and the treatment is really individualized. Um, we individualize treatment by the tumor type. We actually have. I have tests now where we can actually look at the biology of the tumor itself to know if it's going to benefit, for example, from chemotherapy or if it's going to benefit from hormonal therapy. And even beyond that, I'm always individualizing treatment for the woman in front of me or the man in front of me. Um, is this a mother? You know, is this, you know, where is she in her career? What do we need to focus on? You know, women who are diagnosed with breast cancer at 80 may have completely different goals, expectations, and needs than a woman who's diagnosed in her 40s. And part of my job is to understand who that woman is, what she needs, and what her path to healing and wellness will look like and how I can help her get there. Uh, yeah, that's so important. I like you said, who is the woman? And um, I work a great deal in the world of business. And I think that especially nowadays, the impact of cancer has changed, right? It used to be that if I as a woman got breast cancer, it, it, it impacted me and my immediate family. But especially nowadays with you know, the, with business, if I'm a business owner and I have employees, now not only does it impact me, my family, but if something happens that I'm unable to work, it impacts my business, it impacts my employees and my employees' families. Right. So what is, and again, I know you're saying it's a thousand different diseases, but what is my expectation as far as work goes? Can women still work while undergoing treatment yeah. for breast cancer? So in most cases, the answer is yes. Um, so I have many women who work even, you know, through their chemotherapy treatment. So typically, you know, with the, with chemotherapy, you have a dose of medication and usually around day three or four is when you start feeling, you know, not so great. And so women might take a day or two off around that time and then they're able to go back to work after that. Um, so I'd say the majority of women actually work through their chemotherapy. Wow. Um, the thing about it is, though, I always remind people that you have to be kind, you have to be loving, you have to find and give space for healing. And so one of the things that happens with a cancer diagnosis is there is a real loss of power. And so many times women will try to just dig in, I'm going to fight, I'm going to do everything and hold on to what I have because they're afraid of losing. And in that there's a lost opportunity, a lost opportunity to pause for a minute, to be reflective, to be mindful, to give your body time and space to heal. Um, and so I'm constantly reminding people, you know, Work will be there. Things will be there. Um, you also need to make time for you and be mindful of what your body's telling you. So. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just listening here going, wow, okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's important. You're right. I guess my first feeling is just ignore it, right? Just power through it. But I guess you're right. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. cancer is so serious. Um, do you find, is there any issue with depression when people have cancer, I've seen that. I have some friends who've had heart attacks, different issue, but still yeah. one of the major problems with having a major surgery and a major disease was depression. Do you find that also with cancer patients, that they struggle with the yeah. mental aspect of it? Absolutely. And, um, and since we're diagnosing breast cancers in much younger women, you know, what you find is the compound effect of... Um, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, I'm, a few weeks ago, I finished operating on this uh, a 40-year-old woman who was actually 39 weeks pregnant when I diagnosed her breast cancer. 
and she had a very aggressive breast cancer and ended up having you know chemotherapy and then you know bilateral mastectomies and axillary surgery and she's doing dealing with this with an infant and three other children at home and a husband who isn't the most supportive and uh, and yeah she was very very depressed and um, and yes, yeah, she should be, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. it is a lot, it's huge. Um, and so in that situation, you know, I really try to get people to connect with help. But I also try to get, you know, I try to get her to understand this is normal, mm -hmm. this is natural, and this is okay. You know, you are allowed to be who you need to be right now, and that is okay. And if you feel that this is the only space you can do it in my office, come see me every week. <laughs> you know? And just, you know, if you need this space and time, take this space and time. Yeah. And, um, and so I think that's the real for, for women. It's just you're allowed to take the time for you. You're allowed to feel those emotions. You are allowed to experience what you're experiencing. And you don't have to be afraid of it because you are strong and you will come your way back out. And there's help for you to help come back out. Um, but I don't love try you. to gloss over it. <laughs> yeah, and I love, I love the way you're so cognizant of the whole patient, right? So it's not just let's, let's fix what's physically wrong, but you seem to really be involved with every aspect. Yeah. Um, and I think that ties a little bit into your specialty, which is, because to me, I think there's such a mental aspect here too. So it's oncoplastic surgery, right? Which right. is reconstructive as well as so you have the, you have your breast removed and reconstructed at the same time. Do I understand this? Like explain, yeah. explain just what it is and also the benefits. Cause I think I'm seeing physical and mental benefits here. Right. So the way I like to describe oncoplastic surgery is the marriage between cancer surgery and plastic surgery. So, you know, when I was training, which was a while ago. A week and a half ago, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, just that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, my older male um, you know, physicians who were training me, you know, if a woman had a breast cancer, you know, we made this big cut over, you know, the center of her breast and you took out mm -hmm. the tumor and you closed it up and you know, since there was nothing there, once the fluid went away, it would get indented and scarred and, oh. and be horrible. And the attitude was, yeah, but, you know, she's alive. Oh. So and she's she's alive physically, but, oh, my gosh, right. the mental toll, because you said before you need to look at your breasts, and now you're looking, you're seeing a disfigured body. Right. So right. how how do you make that different? Right. And so as I was coming along and doing my training, I kept saying, there has to be another way. There has to be another way. And, uh, and I went to this conference um, and I met J. Michael Dixon, who's uh, one of the foremost experts in the world in oncoplastic surgery. And he was showing these slides of, you know, cancer patients where he removed the tumors and then would reconstruct the breast and they looked amazing. And I went up to him and I said, I really so admire what you do. And, uh, and he said, oh, you know, you should come to Scotland and, and train with me. And I was thinking, ah, you know, he's just, you know, just saying that right. to be nice. And I gave him my card. And a week later, I get an email. I've been, in, I've been invited by Sir Michael Dixon to come to Edinburgh, Scotland to study oncoplastic surgery. I was like, Okay, I'll book that ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, right. Here's an amazing specialty. I'm going to help women. I'm going to do it in Scotland. Yeah, right. that's all good. <laughs> exactly. And so the beauty of it is that instead of removing disease and leaving holes in the breast, you know, what mm -hmm. I do is I actually rearrange the breast tissue um, so that there is no defect, so that there is nothing to, you know, scar in or, or become deformed. The other thing is we never used to pay attention to the other breast. So you would have these women who after breast cancer surgery would have one C size breast and one double D size breast. Oh. Well, how does that work? You know, how do you find a bra? How do you feel good in your clothes? You know, it just 
that doesn't make sense. So part of oncoplastics, what I do is if I'm reducing a significant amount of volume on the cancer side, we do a reduction in the lift on the other side. Oh, so okay. women come out symmetric and intact and with beautiful shape and feeling great about themselves. And, uh, and even for women who need mastectomy, you know, the old mastectomy scars used to be horrendous um, and painful. And so one of the things that I'm able to do is I'm able to do what's called a nipple areola or sparing mastectomy, where I keep the complete skin envelope of the breast, including the nipple and areola. And then my plastic surgeon will reconstruct the breast from within. And the results are beautiful. Oh and you know, and it really gives the message to the women that even if you have to go through breast cancer surgery, it doesn't have to leave you scarred. You don't have to wake up every day and hate what you see in the mirror. And I think that's a real key to moving past the disease. Uh, because if every day you wake up with a horrible reminder, it's really hard to move past something. So let me ask, because we only have a couple minutes, where do women go to find you, right? So, I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously you're going to have this big influx now into Staten Island, New York, but where else? I mean, can you talk to your gynecologist and say, look, I'm looking to have reconstructive surgery as well? When do you start that conversation? Right. So that would be the conversation with the, with the breast surgeon. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things you want to ask is, you know, are you, if it's important to you, and it's not important to everyone, but are you a breast cancer specialist? Is this your specialty? Is this all you do? Um, and then, you know, do you do oncoplastics? You know, do you work alongside a, a plastic surgeon? Um, if I want to have a reduction with my surgery, is that something that you feel comfortable doing? And if you just ask the questions, you'll get a sense for, you know, if your surgeon is... You know, able to do these procedures. And, you know, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of oncoplastic, you know, breast surgeons, um, but the numbers are increasing. Uh, so, you know, if you ask enough questions, then you'll be directed to a person who can give you the service that you need. That, wonderful. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it really sounds like as a woman, if you have breast cancer, right, there are solutions. Yeah. Um, there are ways to survive, not just, I guess, the, the, the disease, but in your life, right? Nice. So um, it's just amazing what you're doing. Yeah. And I just want to thank you so much for being a guest today. Um, for everyone, I mean, here she is, Dr. Taisha uh, Wilson. And you can look for her or certainly talk to your surgeon and find the right solution for you. Thank you so much, Taisha. Thank you. <laughs>